Hello and welcome to our talk, the place where we agree to disagree. My guest today is Frank Kopiters, and our topic is lived experience. Hello, Frank. Welcome. Thank you, Renee. Good to see you. I'm glad I got your name halfway right. Uh, you did. You, no, no, it was completely right. Yeah. I disagree <laughs> with you. It was completely right. <laughs> you may disagree. And we don't need to disagree in this format. But with, if we do, let's do it in the spirit of agreeing to disagree. <laughs> and, there we go. and I think you and I have such a wonderful past history of... We've never met personally, but uh, over, uh, I guess, about five years, we've been in loose contact per email. Mm -hmm. And reading back um, some of this email, we, we, we shared so many stories with each other. Yes, absolutely, from the very beginning. I don't know why that is, because usually, you know, I don't take much time in email dialogues, but with you, it's like your presence or energy field pulled stories out of me. <sighs> and really? and I, have, I love stories. And I think we're halfway on our topic, lived experience, because life's experience. But before we get there, just a brief word of whom I'm talking to, um, dear viewers. Um, I'm not going to say much about you, Frank, because at the end, I will refer again to your website where people can read up your exciting biography, your and your wife's biography. And um, uh, because I'm not saying much to my viewers, just bear it in mind, if you want to, in the course of the next half hour or so, um, you know, tell a story who you are, please feel welcome. Frank is originally from Belgium. Uh, in 1985, he married Kathy Melcher and immigrated to the United States. There he started the Living Light Center. Uh, Frank is working internationally as an intuitive counselor, shaman, and Reiki practitioner and Reiki teacher, and always focuses on the empowerment of his clients and students. Today, he and his wife, Kathy, they live in Belgium again. Is that about right? That's absolutely right. And as I was reading that, did, uh, did I read Melcher right? Melcher. There you go. Dear viewers, that too you will see on their website. Um, why did, I know we, we once contemplated talking about reality and we ended up now uh, two days ago, three days ago when we, agreed to do this our talk we um, decided to, to choose lived experience why and what is lived experience what do you mean with lived experience frank well maybe it's connected you know to to me being uh, back in belgium it's uh, like a new chapter in my life you know i'm uh, i feel i have become an elder and reality you know is such a daunting subject you know i mean Throughout history, people have thought about it. Uh, so I wanted to, to bring it a bit more down to earth, you know. Um, I, I think the story of everybody's life is actually interesting. You know, when people reflect on it, when, when you have an intimate connection with someone and they start telling their life story, parts of it, it's so interesting, you know. Um, I have always been moved by also reading the biographies of, of certain people, you know. And then now I'm reflecting on my own life in a way. And so it's not like a conceptual thing. You know, stories will come up like they sometimes do in our interaction. And in the story, reality is, is reflected, but it's my own lived reality. And, and therefore, it has value. And I think that's true for everyone. There is, a, there is a reality to one's own experience that should be valued. And sometimes that's a little bit of trouble with spiritual concepts. They may be fascinating concepts, but they may not have the seasoning 
of the lived experience in it, you know? And what a wonderful expression, the seasoning, the spice. <laughs> um, yes. Uh, you know, just now I thought, I wonder spontaneously, what is, uh, right now, what is a story of your life you'd like to share? Anything, really. Don't try and be a teacher. Uh, just just respond to what comes to your mind. Uh, it can be funny, it can be profound, it can be sad, it can be anything. Well, what comes, you know, is the, is the recent one of moving to Belgium, you know, because that came pretty much... Out of nowhere, on a Sunday morning, Kathy and I were lying around in bed, and um, a friend of ours sent us a picture. And I think it's interesting, it was a picture without any comment, but the picture started a dream between and a dialogue between me and Kathy, like, oh, yeah, Belgium. Oh, we've been there so many times. And of course, we couldn't because of Corona. And to feel the depth of my connection to my home turf, as it were, or my roots, as they say, you know. And um, the strange thing is that it was a dream that we hadn't allowed ourselves to dream. Because, you know, we, we're busy. We, have a, we had a great life in the U.S., all 37 years of it. It was full and brimmed with fantastic stuff. But then all of a sudden, you know, it's possible to have a different dream. And so there was a little bit of a gap, maybe because of COVID also. And so here we are, just following, you know, that very clear, it was a dream and it was a knowing. And the knowing was, this is the right thing to do. I just, this, this is so profound. Uh, and I, it resonates so strongly. I had exactly the same experience in 1996. Exactly. Tell me. We, were, we came back from Greece, my wife and I. We went to bed in the evening. Uh, we stayed up. Uh, we forced ourselves because of the jet lag. But we went back to bed early at 10. And you, you have to know that uh, my best friend, Mickey, he lives in America. We live together in South Africa. Uh, and ever since that time, we tried to live in the same city. And um, here we are, my wife and I in Hong Kong, switching off the bed light. Are you asleep yet? And the other, and I can't remember who asked whom, and the other person said, no, I'm awake. Are you thinking what I'm thinking? Yes, I think we should go back to Europe. I switched on the light. I called up my relatives in Switzerland, and it was within seconds that we took that decision because there was not a consideration. It was an inner knowing like you just described. Beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. You're the first one who has that exact same, I mean, very, very close, same experience. Fantastic, huh? fantastic. And you have never regretted it, right? No, of course not. <laughs> My wife has come back a few years later to to visit our son who did a, a study there um, uh, and got the feel of how Hong Kong was a few years later. Uh, and for her, that was a bit of a nostalgic trip, a trip going back because she loved living in Hong Kong. Um, and then she came back to Switzerland. And it was very clear. It was the... It, it, it's not even a question whether it's a good decision. Mm -hmm. It is just the only decision. Yeah, the right decision eh? or the only decision. Right, right. Yes. And, you know, I do think that that is something that is happening to more people these days. That, that out of nowhere, and, and this has happened again, you know, for quite a few people that I know in the COVID period, People who do not want to go back to their jobs, right? People who are inspired by this lockdown to have more space. And in that space, I think spirit can grab us, you know? Um, really, it's, it's beyond the regular linear mind. You know, it's like a super mind, you know, that's trying to tell us but we need to be home in a way to find our home, you could say. 
Well, and of course, you're um, you're a mature person. I wasn't back then in Hong Kong, and neither in terms of maturity nor in terms of age. <laughs> and uh, is are you, are you at a crossroad where you're where you're uh, making a new design for your life, where you're saying, "Well, I've been there, got the T-shirt, uh, and, and now I'm on to." And what's your next adventure, Frank? Yes, yes. And and as I, I mentioned, you know, I feel it's to do with being an elder. Um, I have had the American experience. In my case, it was a rich one and, of course, a mixed one as well. I don't like many parts of American so-called culture. I think some of it is not very cultural, actually. But it was rich for me and it helped me on my journey. I could not be today where I am if I hadn't immigrated to the States. But it's also true that in my case, and maybe for many people, the early, early imprints, you know, of being a kid and being surrounded by farms, the nature still so vibrant as a kid, and now being back here and walking in the fields, you know, seeing the trees that I love, it's fall here right now. Everything is so fresh, you know. I see it with the eyes of an, of an older man, um, but also with the eyes of a kid, you know, mm. of a young kid. And also the, especially the sounds of the birds is something that moves me so much. Um, I didn't know I had been missing the Flemish, Flemish Fl Flanders is the north, northern part of Belgium, you know, the Flemish songbirds, they're so beautiful. The blackbirds, the doves, um, birds I don't know, I have seen or heard for the first time, you know. So, and then also the smells, you know, the smells of, of the manure, the, I, every day, I, if I can, I take a walk and raise two horses and I started feeding them like a carrot on occasion or an apple, you know. And so they are befriending me. And I've always been a little bit afraid of horses, you know. Yeah. But it's so sweet to, to open myself to new possibilities and also to speak my, my maternal language again. There's something about language. Uh, I mean, I love English. Uh, actually, I really do. But then to to hear certain phrases and see the beauty in the metaphors, you know. And Kathy is learning Dutch, so that's really fun, you know. Um, I can hear her practicing her Dutch. It's, it's, yeah, there is a sweetness in all that. But as you say, it's a new it's a new adventure for sure. And also, I think there was a bit of a time that was closing. It's, it takes a lot of energy to make such a big shift after 37 years. And so we still have the energy to do it. And, and we did it, you know. And so now I'm basically open to see what manifests. You know, when I listen to you and I could smell the manure, <laughs> I could hear the birds, there was poetry in your language. And you mm -hmm. even spoke about language you speaking your mother tongue and that that actually uh, is a good uh, bridge to talk about oral tradition and written tradition because uh, this is one of i think uh, one of the topics related or maybe uh, headed over our conversation is exactly that lived experience is subjective it's 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 personal uh, and yet the written language, I mean, poetry, uh, oh, I don't have the book here now, but uh, um, my wife just bought me a book uh, of poetry. Um, uh, you know, it's words and it's written. Okay, poetry is not uh, a history book, right? Mm -hmm. And yet it's a written word. Um, so let's talk a little bit about that uh, because you're also uh, a shaman, if, if that is correct to say. I know that your teacher's uh, paintings are surrounding you uh, mm -hmm. as we talk. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, 
in shamanism, I know, don't know very much about it. In fact, the word shamanism uh, has triggered me immensely, probably until, I don't know, uh, probably until about five years ago, if I have to give a date to it. So most of my life, I was, that was, you know, witches and, 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 and strange things. But uh, more and more people I um, value and I treasure the, the relationship with, um, uh, my own Reiki student, Dr. Bolius in Vienna, uh, is in a long year of training in, with a shaman in, in, in Austria. So I had to sort of ask myself, what is my, mm, my issue? What is my, what is it? Um, having said that, I still today, although I have opened, hopefully, my mind somewhat, uh, I know very little about it. But the little I know is that uh, shamanistic knowledge is mainly an oral tradition, isn't it? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. As far as we know, it's the oldest spiritual tradition on the planet, you know, and therefore, and therefore it is oral um, and continues to be oral because, of course, there's many books now about shamanism and and good books also um but really the transmission much like in reiki you know uh, the form that both of us uh practice uh can only be transmitted from say teacher to student you know and of course within shamanism there's many 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 different traditions and, and approaches um and i do understand uh, many people's reticence with the term also shamanism, you know. Um, at some point, I I decided, okay, you know, I have to be true to myself. I have been trained by an authentic Hungarian shaman, maybe the last one from that particular lineage, you know. And it's so important in my life, um, instead of calling this energetic sound or sacred sound i'm gonna call it what it is it's shamanism you know and um what is so endearing to me is i have had the occasion to travel a bit in the world and meet various shamans you know from various traditions and in my experience in my lived experience whenever i meet a shamanic practitioner no matter what the tradition is but there is an a, a immediate kinship, like a camaraderie, like, oh, yes, you, you're one of those, you know? Um, it's it, And it's very inclusive in that way. It's like meeting, you know, a, 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 um, a colleague, you know, if, or if you were to make a, shoes, that you meet, you meet a shoemaker from a different tradition, you know? It's in a way very pragmatic. Um, and of course, it's a direct invocation of spirit itself. And talking about language, very often what happens is that a so-called shamanic language is used. It's a language that is not connected to the way language is used in regular culture. And of course, in poetry, there are great poets who can use that with a precision, with a beauty, with an evocative beauty. That's so amazing. In shamanic language, you can use pieces of language that are so strong. The, the words itself or the sounds that are being uttered bring immediate transmission and transformation, you know? I understand that. Uh, I was driving a little bit on the uh, towards the the value also uh, of the written uh, tradition. Um, so, and just now, the last you said was uh, the spoken language has a tr tremendous power. Um, actually, I want to introduce you um, to a lady. Would you like to meet? Uh, a... I'm always interested to meet a lady, especially if you introduce them, Rene. <laughs> well, I wrote down what I learned about her a little bit. Uh, she is uh, quite petite, 
um, in stature. I imagine her rather like a, a ballet dancer. Um, she is uh, European, North European German, uh, but has a brown skin. Um, she has beautiful green blue eyes. Um, she has black hair, high cheekbones, quite sensuous mouth. I have to introduce you, right? Of course, of course, of course. What a setup. <laughs> oh, look at that. Mm. Do you see her eyes? Yes. Wow. It's like puma eyes. Oh, wow. I'm mesmerized, Rene. You did it. You did it. I would never have suspected this to be uh, somebody of German heritage. Wow, it's like, wow, look at that. Fantastic. And she spent a great uh, amount of her time uh, with um, a great amount of her time. She physically, she spent a crouching and, and, and somewhat spent, uh, bent over. Um, uh, she had uh, veiled off uh, um, uh, like a, a root canal. Her two front teeth are, are very thin and, and it's not clear whether she had a root canal treatment or whether she actually had a ritual, a pain ritual, uh, which in shamanic circles I understand is not uh, unusual. So um, uh, her posture was very crouched for a long time of her his her life and um she also had something which is called um nystagmus it's an involuntary it's a medical term an involuntary mm -hmm. eye movement mm -hmm. and when i read that actually i have a question to you frank when you get into a trance like state um I shouldn't say you get into it. Let me rephrase this. When I get into a meditative kind of state, in an alpha state of mind, as I would call it, um, very often I notice that it helps me to close my eyes and, and just turn my uh, eyeballs a little upwards, mm -hmm. sort of looking in onto the third eye, as it were. And I often notice then that my eyes are starting to jump. And this medical term actually is uh, nystagamus is actually uh, the medical term for this eye movement. And she had that. Uh, how old do you think she is? Oh, wow. I have no idea. But since you talked about her life a little bit, I suspect she might be in her 50s. Uh, actually, on this, she is. Uh, she died probably latest at thirty-five. Um, at thirty-five, and so this picture is probably a take of her life uh, between thirty and thirty-five. Okay. And um, but I meant to ask you: Do you, when you get into a trance kind of uh, state, do you get the same kind of eye movement? Do you know what I'm talking about? Yeah, I do. I only get that on on occasion when I meditate. Um, yeah, I actually remember, <laughs> this is kind of funny maybe, but when I needed new glasses, I decided, this was in my 20s, to uh, wear lenses. And so I was fitted out with lenses and to my great fear and surprise, because I was meditating and my eyes had gone upwards. And so the lenses disappeared behind my eyeball. And I was freaked out because I thought, oh, how shall I get them back, you know? Uh, but after a couple of hours, actually, they came back. And But I, I decided not to wear lenses because of that reason. Um, but no, when I'm in a, in a trance state, uh, I'm actually quite happy about that uh, personality. Like this morning, I was in a trance state doing a session. Um, usually, my eyes are closed, but... I can open them if I want to, and sometimes I do to check with, with the client. Um, I have never this particular shamanic um, phenomenon, which some shamans have, that one eye looks in one direction and the other eye in the other direction. It's, it's not being 
I don't know the term in English, you know. It's not a, um, a medical condition. It's a shamanic spiritual condition of seeing at the same time in two directions. Yeah, actually, this is uh, when I read this, um, uh, this lady, you know how old she is? Or rather, um, uh, obviously, she's passed away and she passed away at the age of 35. So, but you know how old her, her remains are? Nine thousand years. Oh my God! No, you really tricked me, didn't you? No, uh, uh, I I learned about this this morning. Uh, I read in the bathtub. Actually, I read this article in the German uh, magazine, the latest issue here. Yeah. She, uh, that's that's the thing, Rene. I don't think it's by accident that all these shamanic discoveries are being made. You know. Uh, and nine nine thousand years is is of course long long time ago. And anybody of of who I know who studies shamanism would immediately say, "Oh, that's a shaman!" Immediately, you know, right away, no doubt yeah. about it. And, and yeah, and uh, it, uh, to me, what's fascinating is because you said earlier, and you weren't prepared for this. Um, that uh, shamanism is like the oldest uh, way of for expression of spirituality or something to that effect. And in that article, look at this. Um, this is the science, uh, pelagenetics, if I pronounce it correctly, it's a new science. And in fact, uh, in 2022, a Nobel Prize was given to the, to the leading expert of um, this field, mm -hmm. provides insight into spirituality and memory culture in the Stone Age where she lived, uh, an era in human history for which there is no written testament. And another thing which uh, in this context um, uh, I wrote uh, out is this year. I never thought that we could actually firm the thesis that it could be a Stone Age shaman with scientific means. And what's so fascinating to me about this is um, your trait as a shamanism is committed very much to the oral tradition. And here we have modern science, the, the cutting edge science, Nobel Prize 2022, which brings to us that article and that knowledge. And of course, science, the very definition of science and of empiric research is written and is documented. And it's so beautiful because to me it shows they're going hand in hand. They are so valuable, both of these traditions. Yeah, I couldn't agree with you more, you know, and that's where the DNA research is so fascinating too, right? And that apparently all of us come out of Africa, right? And also, I, I don't know if you're familiar with that movie of Werner Herzog, you know, the filmmaker Werner Herzog. He has made a beautiful movie about these caves in France, the caves of Chauvet. And, you know, they, they are about 36,000 years old, the paintings in there, you know, the shamanic paintings. So, I mean, Egypt is a long time ago. Rome is a, this is a jump back in time. That's incredible. The, the, the scale of it. Right. Uh, um, so, so you're 75 now. I hope I don't I'm give some away. 72. 72. Oh, sorry. I confused you. 72 uh, makes no difference. You're at this juncture of your life. A lot of your tradition. Who's your su shamanistic successor? Well, there are many. I'm not going to name one because you know how that is. Oh, you, um, yes. Sorry, I didn't think that Yeah, through. yeah, but, but, you know, many, really many. Yeah, I, I could, you know. Uh, and that's a little bit of beauty. When my teacher uh, initiated me, actually the night before I left for the U.S., you know, so that synchronistically was could not have been a better date. But he um, said, listen, he called me Krishna, Listen, Krishna, I'm initiating you. 
not in my lineage particularly, I'm initiating you in universal shamanism. And that was a great present to me, you know, that he put it that way. Wow. Wow. Uh, I didn't expect my question to come to that, to that, but it's a life experience. Thank you for sharing. Uh, what I did have in mind when I raised the question was more down the, the line of uh, oral tradition. Um, so your successors, the people who, 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 when you have come to wherever you go after we die, um, uh, you, you, your teachings, your knowledge, uh, your wisdom even, uh, is being carried by a number of people, but that has predominantly been passed on to you, to them, by you, uh, on a in a in an oral tradition. Is that right, or am I? Oh, oh, absolutely. Actually, in this morning's session that I happened to give, the the shaman that came to the foreground strongly in that session, you may never have heard of him. Patmasambhava is his name who brought, he was a tantric master who brought um, shamanism to Bhutan and Tibet and Nepal. And he was able, you mentioned at the very beginning, you know, that you had some qualms maybe about the term shamanism or even the phenomenon maybe, but he was able to connect the purity of what he found in Buddhism and the purity of shamanism and make, made it into a very protected kind of practice, you know? So this person lived in the eighth century. So go figure that this is a shaman that I'm learning from, you know? And some of that happened when I was in Bhutan and visiting the many, many temples there where there are tankas, uh, old paintings, where the vibration of, of Padmasambhava is totally part of the painting, you know? So it's a great example of an, not only an oral tradition, but a pictorial tradition, you know, where the images really are able to transcend time and space, like you just did, you know, with that picture from Der Spiegel. I mean, yeah, amazing. Wow, what an amazing picture. I mean, mm. really, it's amazing. Um, yeah, uh, interesting. Uh, thank you. And the the I think the quintessence of a lot of what we're talking about is that um, uh, the openness of um, interdisciplinary conversations between humans and that research in the Spiegel, Spiegel, those people who did all this. So we could, I could describe her very vividly today. There were a collaboration between uh, pelogenetics, anthropologists, medical doctors, historians, radiologists, and so on. Uh, and obviously committed to the, to the very idea of shamanism, an oral tradition. Uh, and that's, uh, I think, uh, very beautiful. Um, you just referred to um, the pictures, the visual impressions, and I shared with you not too long ago uh, that I had um, a mesmerizing experience uh, in Vienna in June. And uh, uh, in fact, uh, if I may show this and share it um, with you and with our viewers, here goes. <laughs> Ah, beautiful, Rene, beautiful. That whole Middle and Eastern Sufi atmosphere. Ah, the heart, you know, the heart. I mean, I get goosebumps just listening to this. Yeah. Uh, and the energy is, is, is palpable, if that is the right word. It's just amazing. Really? Um, and, and to have that kind of experience is in the here and now. 
Uh, and I hope some of our viewers have had that uh, listening and looking at us for the last half hour or so, um, which brings us a little bit to the end of our conversations. I wanted to speak to you also about um, conspiracy theories, about the fact that our uh, lived experience uh, very often is the filter, the mindset through which we uh, perceive outer experiences and then of course it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy we're looking for proof of our convictions to quote uh, Peter Koenig um, I wanted to speak to you about that I wanted to speak to you about uh, um, lived experience in the medical health I think you and I should have another art talk soon but we'll take a new subject how does that sound sounds great deal but before we close on lived experience, uh, how do you feel? What's what's your final take of this half hour conversation we've had? Well, I loved it that you were able to surprise me, you know. Um, and yeah, I'm very moved by the way. So most of our discussion was nonlinear, you know, jumps from here to there. And I think that's quite all right, you know. As you know, I have lived in, in an academic world for a while, for about 13 years, and somehow I experienced that as a straight jacket. I mean, I'm not against science, you know, far from it. Um, but also the amazing imaginative power by jumping from one image or one thought to another thought and be open to each other, you know? So I have enjoyed the dance with which we were able to do this little dialogue. Thank you, Renee. Dance is a beautiful word to, to describe this. And uh, yes, and I see value in the same spontaneity and uh, in the same um, spirit as you just explained. Um, I'd like to say thank you to you. You're in Belgium now. I greet you. I thank you. I'm looking forward to talking and communicating with you soon again. Bye-bye, um, uh, uh, Frank. And dear viewers, I hope you enjoyed this one more time. Um, and please subscribe. Feel free to donate. Uh, we're needing a little bit of money. And um, see you next time.